Good evening to you all. Um, you're all very welcome here to our masterclass for Leaving Cert Physics. Um, my name is Pat Doyle, and um, I'll be kind of running through a few little bits and pieces here with you over the next hour or so. And of course, the uh, the, ma the main focus, I suppose, really of this class this evening is to, um, I suppose, really help you in many, many ways, kind of plan your study between now and you know, basically the early part of June when the actual leave and start exam itself starts. Um, funny thing is, um, you know, sometimes people get a little bit panicky at this time of the year, thinking, oh my God, like, you know, time is going by very, very fast. There's not much time left. But in actual fact is, I would argue, quite a large amount of time left because in actual fact, um, between now and actually the physics exam, you've the best part of four months and a huge amount of work can actually be done in that space of time. And I think uh, most people would be in a situation where like most, if not all your course, maybe at this stage is actually finished. You're like dealing uh, quite a lot with so say, revision. And indeed, if you have a few topics um, left to finish um, in your physics course, so be it, that's no problem, okay? But I would actually argue there's still a huge amount of time Four months is a very large amount of time between now and the examination itself. Now, what I thought I might just do is get straight down to work here because um, one of the first things I was going to mention here to you is um, in the Leave Cert, as you know full well, you've got, say, the Section A and the Section B part of the exam. And if, for example, okay, you just take, say, the situation there with regards to Section A, as you know, uh, Section A, the questions are all based on one thing. They're all based on what we call the, the 24 mandatory experiments. Nothing else can feature, shall we say, um, in Section A except these compulsory experiments. Now, if you just do a small little piece of mathematics, okay, we basically have 22 examination papers to go on. You're going back there as far as uh, the year 2002. And in recent years, we've had five kind of say questions in Section A, but for the vast majority of the years, there was always four. But either way, OK, if we, if we even say there's been four questions every year, OK, and you spread it out over, say, 22 years, you're still talking 88 questions. So I think, you know, when you add in the slight change there recently, you know, you, you're, ta you're talking about maybe 90 past paper questions you can actually physically look at with regards to Section A. Now, there's only 24 experiments. So if you think of, OK, if you have 24 experiments and you basically have 90 past paper questions, the bottom line is all the experiments have already been asked. Now, the funny thing is, when I say this to you, they've actually asked all the experimental questions like already. Technically speaking, I'm guilty of telling you a little white lie because there's one of the experiments, a very, very strange little guy, okay? It's the one, by the way, we actually come across when we're dealing, so we say, with light. And it's one where you're asked to get N, the, uh, the refractive index of a liquid. And it involves what we would call the real depth and the apparent depth technique, that, 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 that kind of an idea. Now, <clears throat> To be honest with you, okay, it wouldn't be kind of a top on anybody's list of priorities, but it's interesting that the experiment for the refractive index of a liquid is the only one of the 24 that actually has never featured on the exam. However, the bottom line is just this, with the exception of that, like some of the experiments have actually featured several times. In some cases, like, you know, the, 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 as regards to the measurement of the wavelength of light, that's actually been featured on eight different occasions. So the one message I need to get across to you very, very clearly and very loudly is looking at looking at the solutions and the questions from the past papers. That's absolutely vital because whatever about part B of the exam, section A is incredibly repetitive, okay? I'd go as far as to say that it's highly, highly likely that the five experimental questions you will get next June will all be repeat questions. And the small little tricks and twists of what the examiner is looking for will be the same this coming June as indeed it has been for, say, for the last 22 years, okay? So I, I'd, I'd really stress working with the questions like from the past papers is really, really important. And of course, when I say working with the questions, I also mean working, by the way, should say, with the solutions, okay, to those questions. Now, in the Institute, for example, okay, when I would supply my students with notes one of the things i do is i also supply fully worked out solutions to all the past paper questions but if um if you want to obtain material like that online uh, you, you'll find the department of education's their own website www.examinations.ie if you go into that okay you can actually find and not necessarily solutions but you can find marking schemes and at least the marking schemes do give you a fair good indication as to the kind of uh, say information that the department are looking for when it comes to answering a question now there's one small little matter I just wanted to mention to you with regards to these experiments okay and it's just this can I just write in one little word here can I just write down the word procedure because I tell you that for a very very simple reason if you take say any of the experiments we actually have I'll, I'll just throw one at you very very briefly okay? Okay. The one where we measure what's called acceleration due to gravity using a free fall technique. We, we often refer to this as just measuring, sort of say, small g. Now, 
do they actually expect you to be able to write out the procedure for the experiment? And it's a very, very simple answer, no. In fact, you can check all the past papers you like. They will never actually ask you to kind of like write out the procedure. So the one thing you don't do over the next four months is waste time learning off the procedure for all those 24 experiments. The simple fact of the matter is, like, you know, as regards to procedure, no, they actually don't ask you to do that. OK, now what you are requested to do basically is just this. OK, they focus on what I would call maybe say the data that is measured, shall we say, in the experiment. OK, and the main thing very, very simply is, OK, two things, OK, uh, what data, OK, is measured and also, by the way, how is the data measured? OK, now let me give you a small little example again. If I go back to my friend here, say, say small g, when you're trying to measure the acceleration due to gravity using what we call the free fall method, there's only two things you actually do. And what you actually do in a case like that very, very simply is you measure what I would call s, which, by the way, represents the distance that the actual say, ball will actually fall. And the other thing you actually measure is t, the time it takes for a particular fall. So in actual fact, OK, you, the, 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 by the way, the, the experiment for measuring the acceleration due to gravity has been featured in four different occasions. And if you look back, OK, yes, he's actually asked you, like, you know, what data do you measure? You measure the distance the ball falls and you measure the time taken. And then, of course, it'll actually ask you how do you measure that? OK, of course, how you measure the distance, OK, basically is you're going to be using a meter stick and how you're going to measure the time. You're going to be using, like, you know, a little electronic, an electronic timer built into the actual, say, circuit. Now, one small little matter, and uh, it's just this here. Be very careful because, you see, when I say to you, like, you measure the distance the ball f falls, that's always referred to as the distance from what we call the bottom of the ball to what's called the trap door, OK, and so on, OK? Now, would it be the case? So I get a repeat as regards to learning off procedure. No, we're not going to be too worried about that. OK, but as regards to data, yes. OK, and there's two things, the what and the how. What data do you measure and then how do you actually measure it? OK, and even if I just throw another little example at you there very quickly, if you were to go back to maybe say one of the experiments for measuring, say, specific heat capacity, what one of the things like you'd have to measure there would be maybe say the mass of the actual liquid. OK, so that that's the what and then how do you measure the mass of the liquid by using maybe say, we'll say scales, you know, you're talking about using appropriate weighing scales better to get the actual mass. Uh, another measurement would be the temperature rise, that would be the what you measure and how you measure that is by, of course, using an appropriate, maybe say, thermometer. So basically what you're always thinking of is, OK, in any one of the experiments, what's the data, OK, and the what and the actual how. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, what again I'll keep coming back to here in all stages is, you know, I'm here because I give you kind of general guidelines, which you cannot be looking at. OK, and I just write down, I just write down the abbreviation PPQ. And what I mean by that is the past paper questions. And then more importantly, OK, more importantly, OK, what I would call the solutions to those past paper questions. OK, now, as I said, I, I would always give those to my students. But if you don't have access to such notes, you can go online and you'll actually find the information there in the department's own website. OK, now, with it being the case, the second little comment I wanted to make, by the way, with regards to, say, Section A, just draw a little line across here. And it's the following. One of the examiner's, um, shall I say, favorite little tricks with regards to experiments is where they come along, and they actually get you to draw a graph. OK, that, that that's fair enough. OK, and then when you actually draw the graph, what you then come along and do is you get the slope, OK, of that graph. And then when you've done that, OK, you then come along like this here and you build it back into what I would call an equation. OK, so just for the record, OK, just be kind of mindful of that. OK, it's, it's a classic trick. Now, it's a little area that, that I do know can sometimes cause a little bit of grief for some students, OK, where you draw your graph. The drawing the graph is usually the OK part, OK? Get the slope of the graph is never really a major problem, OK? But then building it back into the equation can sometimes cause a bit of grief. Now, could I just give you maybe, should say, a little, maybe say, example of this thing here, OK? Some of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with. I'll, I'll just pop this sheet of paper over here for one little second, OK? And you might be familiar with an experiment where you're dealing with what's called a stretched string. And you're trying to show the frequency of, say, a vibrating string or a stretch string is proportional to what I would call one over the length. Now, because it's a one over, and I, I did say proportional to one over length, another way of say, stating that is to say the frequency and the length are inversely proportional. Now, what happens in an experiment like that is in the leave insert, they will give you a set of values for frequency. They, by the way, will be measured in what's called hertz. And they'll come along then, they'll give you values they hear for length. Now, the length could be in centimeters, but, but ultimately, you'll want to make sure you're working the length in meters. And what tends to happen then, say, in the leave insert, very, very simply, is just this, okay? They might come along here and they might give you maybe, say, six values, maybe, say, for frequency. So you're given a selection of values for frequency and you get a selection of corresponding values, for, say, here, like for length. Now, the usual little trick, as I said, applies, you know, if the length is, is in centimeters, make sure you work 
working into meters. Now, the one little problem here, very simply, is just this, okay? You see, you're not gonna be dealing a graph with frequency and length. The one little problem is you have to come along and get what's called the reciprocal of the length. So you'll come along and you'll do, sure, say, say, one over L. And of course, what that would mean is all the values they gave you, okay, but you'd have to get what's called their reciprocal. So for example, okay, if the first value there, I should say, was a two, it'd be one over two, commonly called 0.5. You know, if this value here, I should say, was a three, it'd be one over three, whatever, 0.33. Now, the only the small little matter is, okay, when you do a one over, your units shift from meters to meters to the power of minus one. And of course, you'd fill in your various values. Now, I find most people are reasonably okay with that, provided you remember, oh yeah, 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 you have to do the one over L. But then what actually happens is you get about, to say, drawing your graph. Now, your graph is drawn usually, okay, and you have your frequency on the y-axis, which again, I, I point out is actually, say, measured in hertz. And then on the x-axis, not so much the length, okay, but it's the values for what I would call one over length. And again, those rather strange little units, meters to the power of minus one. Of course, the reason for that is because it's one over the meter. Now, as you would expect, you get a straight line graph passing out of the origin. You join your dots together. No big surprise with that there. That, 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 that part is fine. But where this becomes a little bit of an issue is, okay, as I said here, you draw your graph and usually as I said, most students are fairly okay with that. When they're actually then trying to get the slope of the graph, okay, that usually is not the problem. But do remember that the slope of this graph or the slope of any graph for that matter is the y's divided by the x's. So the slope would actually be the y value, which is frequency, and you divide by the x value, which is one over L. But the weirdest thing of all is when you get F and you divide by one over L, you get the one over L, you, you, you know, you kind of invert and multiply, and you actually end up, would you believe it, guys, with a value for what's called FL. So the weirdest thing of all is when you successfully draw your graph and you get your slope, your slope is the numerical value for FL. Now, the great thing about this is, okay, they would have actually given you maybe, say, say six values for frequency, six values for length, okay? And by getting the slope, it's like getting the average. It's like getting the F and the L and multiplying them and then working out an average. You see, the whole idea of getting the slope, it's like, like, like what I call a kind of an averaging technique that our particular examiner seems to like. Now, you might say, well, what's, what, what, what's that got to do with the equation? Well, you see, the actual equation that kind of controls is where the experiment I'm referring to here, it's a famous equation that's that says frequency is equal to one over two L by the square root of T over mu. And that's the equation, okay, that if you like, as it were, controls the behavior of all string instruments. And of course, you know that L is the length of the string, T is the force used to stretch the string, course, it's called tension. A stressing force is always referred to as tension. And that kind of symbol there, mu, that can be a little bit problematic because it has different meanings in physics depending on what part of the course you're doing. Here, which I believe, guys, it stands for the mass of one meter of the string. It's called the mass per unit length. People often say to me, Pat, like, you know, could you not just, um, could you not just use M, you know, for a mass, which would seem a little bit more logical. And personally, I, I think that'd be a great idea, but I'm just letting you know, that's not what they actually use. They actually use the Greek symbol mu. But a very kind of popular question with the examiner, okay, would be, okay, go find the value from mu. Go, go, go try and find that, okay? Now, what you basically have to do with your formula here is you have to square everything, okay? So you're going to say to me, okay, frequency squared is square one, I get one, two squared is four, and L by L is L squared. But when I square the square root sign, I simply can just get T over mu. It's like the squaring just kind of say eliminates the square root sign. I bring the mu up and I bring the F squared down, and I very simply get mu is equal to T over, okay? And I have here four, and then I have L squared, and I have F squared. So what basically happens is the guy has supplied the data. You've actually, okay, had to adjust the data. That part's not too bad. You've drawn the graph. That's usually acceptable enough and you get the slope of the graph. But the weirdest thing of all is look at that slope, guys, and then look at my formula because why? If I just get my red pen here for one second, okay? And if you just let me put a bracket, say there and there, what is L squared, F squared? Well, it's this guy here. L squared or F squared, L squared is the same thing. And basically what I'm saying is we know that FL is a slope. So the F squared, L squared would be the slope squared, which basically means your mathematical formula becomes mu is equal to tension over four times, okay? And instead of having the L squared and the F squared, you will come along and you put the slope value squared below the line as a case of amen, job done. Now, the last time this featured, okay, on the Lehman search is worth pointing out to you, was back in the year 2016, okay? 
and we would agree it's now 2024. Okay, and of course I I I, I picked this particular say experiment for a reason. The reason being like you know it's in the category of what I would call maybe say you know, reasonably likely worth having a little look at. Okay, and it's a classic example. Okay, of how you got your data, you worked out the slope, and you very cleverly built the slope back into the mathematical formula, and that's the most correct way of actually shall we say doing a calculation. And as I said, check out the you, you see yourself it was back in the year 2016. You'll be able to locate the question. Okay, and I would suggest by the way having a little look at that there. Now, would what I just done there, would that be regarded as challenging? Oh yeah, oh absolutely yes. In fact, the main reason why I decided to draw your attention to this is that this is an area of, that causes a lot of grief for a lot of students. Now, if you happen to be somebody and you're sitting you know, at home saying, good God, Pat, this looks fine to me. Well, then that's great. Good, good for you, you're, you're lucky. But for the vast majority of what I would call your competitors around the country, uh, this would be regarded okay, as quite a challenging, I should say, little idea. In, in in fact, if you were to take the maybe say the top ten tricky ideas, this would definitely be in there. Okay, and again, I, I simply point out is where you take your formula, you do a bit of manipulating on your formula. You were asked to get a value from you, and you end up like this. And uh, by the way, just to let you know, the value for the tension would be supplied in the question, and it'd be a matter of putting in the tension value and then four times the slope which, by the way, you've actually worked out here yourself. So I just thought, you know what, okay, that that'd be one, by the way, just to keep what I might call a bit of an eye on. Now, you might say, is, is that the only experiment, like, you know, where you've got to get a graph, get the slope and build it back uh, into the equation? No, no. Uh, there's a couple of other ones, okay, where it actually would feature as well, okay? And another small little one I just thought I'd mention there to you just very, very quickly. If we just take this guy out of the way here for one little second, another one that that's worth just kind of commenting on, and I'll tell you very, very simply what it actually is. If I was to come along here and if I was to write down the word resistivity, R-E-S-I-S, -S, and say T-I-V-I-T-Y, and the symbol for resistivity is actually a Greek letter, is that Greek letter there, guys, pronounced rho. OK, it's actually, would you believe it, the same symbol we use for the for the for the density of, of, of a material, but a bit unfortunate is the same symbol. But we talk about the resistivity, I'll actually say here of a piece of wire. Now, the funny thing about it to say is just this, OK, if, for example, OK, you just go to your, your actual formula that you that you need with regards to this, the main formula for resistivity is rho is actually equal to I'll write down here or a over L. Now, if this was to become a graph question, OK, what you'd find is you would be given a selection of values of resistance and a selection of values of let. So basically what would actually happen is someone would give you a little table and there might be maybe, sure, say, 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 maybe say six values for resistance, six values for let. Now, the graph you would draw there would be a very, very simple graph. This here would be, sure, say, say, resistance on the Y and this here would be, sure, say, say, let on the X. Now, naturally enough, of course, your length will be in meters and your resistance here is measured in what we would refer to as the ohm. Now, if I pull back this other sheet of paper there for one little second, the last question I drew your attention to, you had to do a bit of an adjustment. You had to get the lens into one over lens. Funny thing is here, no adjustment. Oh, no, no, no. This guy would be what I would call giving you a much nicer graph to draw. Now, when you would actually draw this graph, the funny thing is, as you would expect, the, the points link up and you get a straight line graph passing through the origin. No big surprise there. And then, then, what I would put then to you very, very simply would be, okay, when you'd work out the slope of that graph, like I said to you earlier on, slopes are always Y's over X's. So your slope would be the R divided by the L. It'd be the average of all the R's divided by all the L's. Now, you might say, well, Pat, what, what benefit would be getting the slope to me? Well, come back to your basic formula here that says rho, the resistivity of a wire is R A over L, okay, like that, okay, and very, very simply, I'll separate it out, okay, I'll just write down R, I'll push the A out like that there, over the L, and if I get my red pen again, here we go again, guys, the R over the L would actually be the slope, and effectively, okay, what you'd actually be saying here is, you'd be saying rho, the resistivity of the wire would be, and very simply, you'd actually get your slope value, which you've actually previously worked out, should say, say, like that there, and of course, you'd be multiplying it by what's called the cross-sectional area of the actual wire. Now, again, there's a second example of this thing of, you know, drawing a graph, getting the slope, throwing it back into an equation, and the funny thing is, okay, would you believe it, he's only ever done that once, and the interesting thing was the once was back in the year 2020. And if you, you're very welcome to check it out. It actually happened to have been question four that year. But of course, the problem with 2020, as I'm sure you can remember, is that was the COVID year. That was the year where the exam was cancelled. And you've you got to remember that the examiner would have written that exam like months beforehand, before we were like aware of this COVID situation. And, you know, I, I, I always feel 
this was a little trick he had up his sleeve, kind of ready to kind of, you know, pounce with this one. And then, of course, 2020 happened and the examiner, if I could use the expression, got slightly outmaneuvered by a, a, an international pandemic, you know, like type of thing. So um, basically what actually happened is the question actually never really happened. Now, I know the exam was run the following November, which only a handful of people sat that exam that didn't really count. But the great thing is we now can go back and have a look at that. We can see the exact question I'd be referring to. And it's again one I'd be keeping a bit of a watchful eye on. OK, and the reason I just mentioned this to you is I do know for a fact that the idea of, you know, drawing the graph, getting the slope and then building it into the equation, that can be problematic. OK, so I just thought I'd mention those two there to you. OK, now you might say, OK, Pat, so if I bring back this previous page, I've got to watch out for the one about the frequency and let. Okay, I get that. Okay, and then I've got to watch out for the one here about, say, the, the, the resistivity of a wire. Okay, and then would there be any other ones that would be worth kind of keeping an eye on? Well, funny thing is, yes. Um, another one to watch out for there would be what we call the G, where you have to do G by what's called the free fall. Okay, another one is believe it, where you actually try to measure small G using what we call the simple pendulum. Okay, just just often refer to say as just G by the pendulum and and. The other one I'd mentioned and to you very, very simply, OK, in electricity is where we deal with what we'd refer to here, say, as, say, Joule's law, just to kind of keep a bit of a watchful eye on that as well. OK, now I didn't want to dwell too long on the one idea, but I just wanted to start off there, but just kind of say, just drawing your attention just to what I might call this idea here, should we say, of, um, should we say, the, the mandatory experiments in Section A. Now, there was one of the small little thing I just, just wanted to kind of comment on, OK, and it's just this here. I might just get this out of the way here for one little second. Um, when you're dealing with the experiments in Section A, they constantly ask you things like, you know, what steps can you take to improve the accuracy of a particular experiment. Now, there's one thing you have to always kind of keep in mind, okay? And it's just this here. I'll just write down the following, okay? I'll just write down this title here of large, I'll say, um, measurements. Now, that's one of the, what I would call like the kind of the golden rules we have in physics. If at, all, if at all possible, make larger measurements rather than smaller ones, okay? And it's always beneficial to do something like that, okay? Now, you might well ask, but, but, but why, Pat? Well, I, I know I've heard this before, but why are larger measurements better, okay? And I'll put a very, very simple example here to you guys, and it's just this, okay? Now, see that marker I have down there? I'm just going to pop the marker down like so. Imagine instead of this being an online class, imagine we were all physically in one of the rooms in the Institute itself. And I suddenly produced this marker here. OK, and as well as that there, I kind of I produce this ruler. OK, actually, the funny thing is, OK, I'm just looking at the ruler I have actually what I find fascinating about this is it says shatterproof. OK, but I think a bit of a false advertising that I just managed somehow not to shatter the thing. OK, actually, it might be better if I got a slightly better ruler. OK, one maybe say like this here. So imagine I give you the ruler, I give you the marker. OK, and basically what I asked you to do is, would you do me a favor? Would you measure, by the way, the size of this marker. So I ask somebody to come along and tell me, should say, say how long the marker is. And I basically ask somebody to tell me how wide the marker is. Maybe should say, say at this end down here, say like so. Now, in good faith, I hand you, should say, the marker and I hand somebody my ruler. Now, person should say measures the actual width and says to me, Pat, that is one centimeter wide. OK. And should say, as regards to the actual, say, length, OK, they say to me that marker of yours is 10 centimeters long. And I say, OK. Now, there's one little problem. I provided the marker, as you can see here, OK, I provided the ruler. But what students didn't realize is the ruler I provided was, can I put it in very simple English, slightly dodgy. What I mean by that is it was a badly made ruler. And what the student didn't notice was it was missing a millimeter. OK, there was a millimeter missing off the ruler. OK, let's call it the uh, El Cheapo ruler that I was using. OK, now. If the ruler is missing a millimeter, OK, I'd actually argue both those measurements are wrong. But what I need someone to do is do a tiny bit of maths for me, because if they're bought out by a millimeter, how does a millimeter compare to a centimeter? Let me think. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's one part in 10. So a millimeter will be one part in 10. That means I'm guilty of what I would call a 10 percent error. Now, if I'm out by one millimeter compared to 10 centimeters, when you compare one millimeter to 10 centimeters, it's not one part in 10, it's one part in 100, OK? This guy here is guilty of a 1% error. So here's here you have two students, OK, basically doing a small little bit of experimental work, OK? They both made the same mistake of a millimeter, but percentage wise, it's a 10 percent error here. It's only a 1 percent error here because why? Larger measurements would always give you smaller percentage errors, not smaller errors, smaller 
percentage errors. And that's the logic behind that. So whatever experiment you're doing, always try and go for, if it's angles, bigger angles. If it's lengths, longer lengths, okay? If it's masses, larger masses, okay? Because the same logic will hold true. You see, the mistake is what matters is the percentage errors over actually the comment we're making here, okay? And I repeat again, larger measurements will automatically give you smaller percentage errors. Now, when I do this in, a, in what I call a, like a live class, people will often say to me, well, sorry, Pat, there's one little problem. And you provided the marker, okay? And then you provided the actual ruler, but you gave us a dodgy ruler with a missing millimeter, okay? And people say to me, you know, in the school I go to, I've got a very respectable teacher, and my teacher would never give me a dodgy ruler. They wouldn't do something like that. So therefore, your logic is flawed. But the argument I've put to that student is, okay, you can get a ruler anywhere you like on the planet. But isn't it a reality, okay, that say anything you have is, so by the way, it's going to say expand and contract due to high temperatures and low temperatures. So my argument is, if you have a ruler that was made in a factory, say at a temperature of say, maybe say 15 degrees Celsius, but your lab happens to be at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, I'd argue that ruler has expanded slightly. And I'd actually argue it's out by a little bit. So here's the thing, okay, my, my, my claim is every bit of measuring equipment that we have is, 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 is it is possible for it to expand or shrink, you know, due to changes in temperature. Now, the expansion of the shrinkage might only be very, very small, but that's not, that's not the point. It doesn't matter what the mistake is. It's the percentage mistake. I, I, I would actually argue, okay, that, that while I just gave a silly little example, I my, I'd argue is that every piece of equipment is slightly flawed no matter how good it is, okay? And I'd actually argue that little flaw will, will, will give you a larger percentage error with smaller measurements, and it'll give you what I call a smaller percentage error with larger measurements. Now, nobody's going to actually ask you to justify this, okay? But I just couldn't res resist just mentioning this because a lot of people say to me, you know, when I'm, when I'm teaching at the Institute, things like, I, I've, I've always heard, you know, this thing about larger measurements. What, where was the logic behind it? And there's a the logic, guys. That, that's basically it, a simple little example. Now, you won't be asked to show the logic, okay? But I always feel if, if somebody can explain something to you and you can kind of believe it i always feel it's kind of easier i think than to kind of say to learn that okay and to be able to talk about it in the examination so i very much just wanted to draw your attention to that now little drop of the old water okay as i go along okay oh by the way guys that actually is just water okay i mean you know i wouldn't rather think wild that'd be like having tea or coffee in the middle of a class whoa that'd be far or maybe just stuff like that at all now there's another thing I wanted to draw, like to draw your attention to, we should say, and it's just this. I want to write down one word, and the word I'm going to write down is the word derive. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I often jokingly say, you know, your favorite word in an examination. Of course, for most people, that's not the case at all. But I just thought I'd mention something to you. How many things do you have to be able to prove or derive for the purposes of the leave insert? Now, believe it or believe it or not, here's the actual list. First of all, okay, I'll write down what I will call the equations of motion. Now, you know what they are, okay? By the way, they're all actually written down there on page 50 of the maths tables, okay? So you've got V equals U plus AT, S equals U, T plus half AT squared, and so on. So that, that, that that's one of the first things they mentioned to you, okay? Now, also, by the way, if you don't mind me saying so, there's a really nice little proof here in what I will call, say, say circular motion. And what you're basically trying to prove is this little link here, guys. You're trying to prove that angular speed is linear speed divided by the radius of the circular motion. I kid you not, okay? Now, there's a little, say, little say derivation that people sometimes forget about, okay? So it's basically just deriving that particular link there. And the next little, shall say, derivation is the one pertaining to the planets, okay? And the one of the planets is you're trying to prove that when we say that period squared is proportional to what we call radius of orbit cubed, okay? Now, that's your proofs in mechanics. The equations of motion are uh, proving that little rule in circular motion and proving that little rule there, if you don't mind me saying so, in planets, okay? Now, hold on, hold on to that for one little second because when you then move away from that, okay, when you go into, say, the area where you study light, there's one little proof you have to come up with, okay, which says n lambda, is equal to d, and I'll write it in here, so we'll say sine theta. That's often considered to be uh, the, the, the diffraction grating, uh, say, experimental, uh, or experimental uh, say, equation, I should say, okay? And then another little section, by the way, I'll just write down here would be in what I would call, should we say here, say electricity. Now, the problem with electricity is it's the actual formula you use for combining resistors in series and then doing the ones in parallel. And of course, when resistors are in series, we'd say things like the total resistance is the resistor one 
added on to a resistor to add it on, whatever, like straightforward in this case of just adding numbers. But the trouble is when they're in parallel, you basically have this formula that one over the total resistance is one over what I would call say resistor one, you add on as a fraction one over resistor two plus and so on. Okay. So basically what they see, I, I, I have a habit of kind of say combining those together, although they actually are asked as separate little derivations. And then your final little one guys, okay, would be in the section dealing here, say very, very simply with magnetism. Okay. And the one I'm referring to here very, very simply is we have to derive the famous equation that F is equal to, and I'll spell it out here very, very simply guys, Q V B. Okay, that's Q stands for what's called the charge. Okay, V by the way there stands for what's called the speed, and B is that rather funny thing called magnetic flux density. Okay, and I kid you not, guys, there are what I would call your six derivations, your equations of motion, your one in circular motion, your one of the planets, and then there's one there saying light. Okay, the electricity it comes in two little parts, and then this guy here. Now there's your six official derivations, but as is typical of the Leibniz cert. Do you know, I would actually argue there's another one which isn't listed here and it's actually not actually listed per se as a derivation, but they've actually asked it by the way on a number of occasions and I'll tell you what it basically is. To that list, okay, you could actually add on one more and what I'll do is I'll just get my little red pen here, okay, and I'll put it on, if you like I could actually call them derivation number zero, okay, and what it basically was is where you're actually asked to show or to verify that you say force F is equal to MA, which by the way of course is the cornerstone of the backbone of um, sure, mechanics because it's basically Newton's second law. Okay, and there will be a list of derivations. Now, is it worth your while learning the derivations, which is the main reason why I'm drawing your attention to this? Okay, and I have to be honest with you guys. Um, I, I, I'm going to say very clearly a yes, and they don't they know the reason why I say that. Okay, I'll tell you very, very simply why a bit of a logical thing, and it's just this if I popped it over there for one little second, okay, you see, most of those derivations when they pop up in the insert, you're talking, say, 12 marks. Now, 12 marks may not sound like an awful lot, okay, but here's, here's your issue. That's 12 marks, okay, out of what I would call a total of, say, 56 marks in what would be a section B question. Now, here's your issue. What if one of those comes up and you genuinely don't know it? And therefore, you leave a bit of a blank and you've lost 12 marks out of 56. You're talking approximately, guys, 21% of the question, a shade over 20%. Now, if you lose a little over 20%, you've lost a H1, you've lost a H2, so you're now down to a H3 grade in that question. And for anyone chasing a result, maybe say like a H1 or a H2, that's that's kind of a situation you don't want to find yourself in. Can, can, can I put it very, very simply? If you were chasing, say, a H1, <clears throat> um, and if one of your questions drops into the high 70s, you're going to have to work really well on maybe say two or three questions to bring your average back over to 90 again. And that, 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 and there lies your problem. So I, 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 I how, probably the best way to put it is I nearly talk or talk about what's called, what I call the fear factor. And what I mean by that is it's the fear of you getting this lovely question popping up on the leave insert. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the question is a derivation and you're sitting there thinking, oh darn, I actually don't know this. And then you have this dilemma, good God, now if I don't know the derivation, I've lost 21% of the marks, I better not do this question. So it could be a bit of a deal breaker. And that, that's why I would say too, now here, here's the thing, as regards to learning derivations, they're an absolute nuisance, they're a bit of a pain. At the, personally speaking, it was up to me, I don't think I'd bother putting derivations on a similar, as I really, really don't think I would. But the reality is they're there, they're there to stay, and there's really not not an awful lot, by the way, guys, we can actually talk about say, say things like that there, okay? As I say there too. Uh, sorry, sorry, you're you're just mute. I see what the problem is there. Okay. 
best friend love, okay i say i beg your pardon there guys i somehow managed to actually mute myself okay uh james the guest there you put a very thank you very much james you're tell you one thing you're a gentleman james okay you, you, you remind me of myself at a good time okay i appreciate that thanks very much guys okay now what i was trying to say there to you was just this um imagine this here say is the moon maybe so say like so okay and the moon is going around the earth. Now, it takes the moon a little over 27 days to run around us once. Okay, fair enough. Okay, and we have a name for that. When the moon runs around us like this here, we call that the period or the period of time. And we give it a symbol, capital T. Fair enough. Now, one small little matter. What if you could measure from the, dis the middle of the moon to the middle of the actual earth? Just say you could measure that distance there. And what I do very, very simply is, I'll just come along, okay, with my blue pen, just draw in that distance there. Now, from the middle of the moon to the middle of the earth is called the moon's radius of orbit. Now, hold on one little second. That's a bit of an unfortunate title because I'll tell you why. The symbol is capital R. And what I find annoying about that is, you see, the letter capital R could be just radius or radius of orbit. And two, there are two different things. The radius of the moon is from the middle of the moon to the edge of the moon. Okay. But from the middle of the moon to the middle of the earth is the moon's radius of orbit. So be very careful. Now, this guy called Joannes Kepler. By studying and looking into the night sky over a period of about 40 years and doing all kinds of wonderful measurements, he discovered a cave that when you look, shall say, at things like the moon going around the earth or lost the earth going around the sun or moon going around any other planet out there, the periodic time squared, OK, and the radius of orbit cubed are proportional to each other. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I find it very, very strange that that's true for all what would I would call satellites. And when I say satellites, I mean the moon could be seen as a satellite of the earth, the earth could be seen as a satellite of the sun, and so on and so on. Okay. Now your job is prove that. Okay, how would you prove something like that? Now, the funny thing is just this, just, just so we can run to this here very, very briefly, okay. How you set up the proof is you say, well, okay, the moon is kind of can I use the word locked in a kind of an orbit around the earth, like so. And if I said to you, okay, it's running around in a circle, how is that? What, 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 what's caused that to happen? Okay. And I'd write it like this here. I'll just write down here very, very simply. Okay. I'll say here the gravitational, okay, I'll say here force, okay, of, and I'll spell it out like this here, very, very simply, guys. The earth, I'll say here, say, um, on the moon. That gravitational pull, that's what's making the moon run around in a circle. Okay. And I would say to you, that would be equal to, what I would call the um, the centripetal force. And you would agree, okay, you see, a centripetal force is required to make something move in a circle. So what I'm saying here to you very, very simply, in a case like this here would be, okay, that this, 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 this when the moon can say it runs around the earth like this, this gravitational force that the earth has on the moon is a centripetal force. Now, my next question I want to put here to you is, do you happen to know by any chance the mathematical formula for the gravity force that the earth has on the moon? And the answer very simply, guys, is, I kid you not, capital G, okay, I'll use big M for the mass of the Earth, a slightly smaller M for the mass of the Moon over, and it's meant to be the distance, but the distance between them, their centers there is called R, which I will say R squared. So it's G, M1, M2 over distance squared. Now, in this case here, okay, uh, you don't have to memorize that because I'll get the formulas in the mass tables, I think it's about page 56. Now, Centripetal force, there's two equations for centripetal force. They're both sitting on the end of page 51 of the tables. And the one I'm going to go for is the one that says m omega squared r. Okay, that's one of the two formulae you find on the very end of page 51. And the first thing you look here is the small m's cancel. Wonderful. Now, you bring the r squared across and you very simply get g m is equal to, and you get omega squared, but the r squared by the r is the r cubed. And I'm thinking, Yippee, I'm halfway there already. I've got my T squared. Now, the next thing is just this, okay? I want to get rid of Omega. So I say to myself, okay, capital G, capital M is equal to, now would you believe it, guys? Omega, okay, is the same thing as, I'll write down, 2 pi over T. <clears throat> Excuse me, which, by the way, I have to square. And then this here, I'll write in here, say my R cubed. And you're probably sitting there thinking, Pat, Pat, where, where did I get that Omega was 2 pi over T? Well, would you believe it, okay, on page 54 in the maths tables, they tell you this. They actually tell you, okay, that t is equal to 2 pi over omega. I kid you not, guys, that's written on the maths tables, okay? And then, and then, what you'll actually find, okay, is if you bring the omega up 
and the t down, that's where omega is 2 pi over t. That's where I got that from. Now, if you let me just do a tiny bit of tidying up here, I get capital G, capital M is, you square the 2 to get a 4, pi squared is pi squared. There is the R cubed, and below the line, t by t is a t squared. When you cross multiply, you very simply get the t squared is equal to, you get the 4, you have the pi squared, you have the R cubed all over capital G, capital M. Now, one small little matter. 4 and pi are numbers that don't change. M, the mass of the earth, doesn't change. And G itself is also a number. It's a constant, a universal constant that doesn't change. So if the 4, the pi, the M and the G don't change, collectively together, they could be regarded as a constant, which entitles me to say that T squared is proportional to the R cubed. And the reason for the proportional is because that combination there is one big constant. Now, here's what I'm going to get across to you. What do they ideally look for in the leaving search from you, okay? And what they ideally look for, guys, is, okay, the diagram wouldn't really be necessary. I just draw the diagram just to kind of clear up my own mind. That one little piece of English there, okay, made a statement, and then five or six little, six little lines of algebra, and you're on a winner. Now, when I said to you, you could be talking 12 marks out of 56. The reason I picked that one is you could be talking 15. And 15 marks out of 56, you're talking there now in excess. You're talking about, say, 26% of a question. And that would certainly be a bit of a deal breaker, okay? And, of course, another reason why I just decided to show you that one is we actually haven't had something on the planets now for a little while. So I, I, I think looking ahead to next year, and I think the planets would be something that would be worthwhile having a bit of a look at. I genuinely feel that, okay? And then um, what I would say to you is, and while you may not be a big mad fan of derivations, if you were thinking of having a go with the planets, that would definitely be something, by the way, that would actually be on your hit list, excuse me. But um, <coughs> I definitely would, by the way, include that, okay? Because again, you see, the 12 is bad enough. It's the 15 marks would actually be what I call the real fear factor. And I think for what I would call a small amount of work. And then people sometimes say to me, Pat, what's the best way like to learn something like that, okay? And the only answer very simply is blank paper and one of those guys, a pen. The only way I've ever learned a derivation myself down through the years was literally practice writing it out. That's literally okay what I actually would have done. Okay. So you, you, you're constantly just trying to kind of say, just, just practice writing it out. And at this stage of the year, just kind of like learning is not very exciting. In fact, um, I, I'm trying to think of a word that was the exact, exact opposite meaning to exciting. Let's call it non exciting. Okay. But, but you know what I'm trying to say? It, it's a bit of a nuisance, a bit of a pain but it pays. And that's why I would be very, very tempted, by the way, if you don't mind me saying so, to have what I would call a look at that there. And that's why I very much wanted to mention the idea there to you of a thing called derivations, okay? Now, one of the small little thing, okay, that I'm very, very conscious of, okay, no, no harm commenting on this is the following. Could I again maybe say, just pop it over there for one little second. And what I'm gonna to suggest to you is, um, do you have a time plan at the ready? What, 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 what do you reckon? Okay, what, what, what kind of a plan do you have to say with regards to a division of time coming up to the exam itself? Now, the funny thing is just this. Um, you know the way we, we know there's a section A, there's a section B, and we know that the questions are not exactly worth the exact same amount of marks. For, for, for example, okay, um, when you consider, for example, maybe you should say, say section A, okay, and um, there you're talking, say, uh, 40 marks, okay, for one question. Now, the funny thing then is when you go to, for example, let's say, say section B, each question carries a price tag of, say, 56 marks, okay, which again, that, that's fair enough, okay. But here's the gas thing, guys, okay. All told, like, if, you know, all goes according to plan, you will actually have to answer, say, three questions out of five there. Now, it doesn't sound like a great choice, but that, that's good because we know all the questions are going to be repeats. And here, guys, we've actually got to answer, say, five questions, okay, say, out of nine. And that's a very, very good choice, okay? So basically, you're talking three and five. You're talking, sort of, say, eight questions. And you're saying to yourself, hmm, it's a three-hour exam. And you're trying to, say, work it out mathematically, what should I do? And you know what, guys? I kid you not. My approach here is a very simple approach, and I really, really mean this. I've been saying for years, and I've told students, work on the principle of 20 minutes for each question, whether it's a section A or section B. Now, the first thing I know people are going to say, but, 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 but Pat, surely in section B, you know, there's more marks, you'd give more time. Well, not necessarily, no. And I'll tell you why I, where this is coming from, okay? I find in section A, that most of the questions are, can I use, I, I don't, I'd never use the word easy, but I'd use the word, say, like fair and okay. 
And the thing is just this, they do tend to be what I call sometimes just a little bit tedious. Even a simple thing like graph drawing, you have to kind of slow it down because you don't want to make the obvious little kind of say little numerical slips. Um, I showed you earlier on where you might be giving measurements and you might have to get their you know, invert a measurement. Again, I would say slow down when you're doing that. I, I really feel when you're doing questions of section A, if you rush them, you'll make small little silly little numerical slips along the way, mainly because we're not robots, we're humans. And what I actually find, even though you're getting less marks here, I still maintain, I think 20 minutes per question is a very, very good plan. Now, let me explain what I mean by that, okay? And it's the following. The exam, say we assume is a morning exam. So when you go, OK, it's 9.30. And I would say between 9.30, OK, and maybe you should say, say 10.30 in the morning, OK, you have a very, very simple task, OK? And what's that, OK? You're going to say, read what I will call here, say very, very simply, OK, your section A, OK? You're going to then come along, OK? You're going to kind of say, choose what I would call your three questions, OK? And then you're going to do your three questions. Now you've got one hour, so technically speaking, you don't really have the full 20 minutes per question because, okay, you're going to have to have a look. You, you, okay, you'll very, very quickly look, you'll, you'll recognize straight away what the five experimental questions are. And for a lot of people, they might say, well, you know what, Pat, there's one experiment I don't like, that's so I'll rule that one out. But the only thing is read the question. Don't don't just jump into a question because, oh, that, you know, it, it's about G by free fall. I like G by free fall. Have a read the question and you have to kind of read carefully. Choose wisely, okay? And You've only got an hour to get the three of them done. So technically, you're probably not really working. You're probably working more maybe on like 17, 18 minutes a question. But you're setting yourself the task, okay, of, of should I say, giving yourself one hour to get, should I say, section A taken care of. Now, most people tell me that's doable. Um, and I, I, I talk to students, I've been dealing with students for years now, and I've heard hardly anyone ever tell me um, they've had a problem with time in leaving cell physics. Usually they say to me the timing was just absolutely grand. You know, people say, you know, I had the exam done, Pat, with maybe 10, 15 minutes to spare. OK, now I know some people may be a little bit slower in writing, but even still, OK, I think you should find time why should be OK. But that that's your challenge for the first one hour. Now, there's also another reason why I suggest starting with that. It's a very clever little, little bit of psychology here. You see, the reality is most people's favourite part of the exam is section A because the questions are so repetitive, you know, you, you'll see, but basically the, the questions you're going to do next year are going to be repeats of what's already out there. Uh, it's material you are familiar with, okay? And it's, most people tend to do quite well in section A. So by doing that there, I think you're getting yourself into a good humor. You're, 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 you, you, you give yourself what I call that feel good factor in actual an examination. So there's a bit of psychology here in starting with a topic like Section A, because no matter what, you'll be able to write loads, okay? Now, yeah, okay, you're human, you might make a little slip along the way, but by and large, okay, this will go well for you, okay? Now, uh, when your first hour is up, okay, now you're moving into the Section B. So you're now coming along here, you know, maybe say you're, say, at 10.30, and this is going to basically occupy you now until, say, at the end of the exam, which would be the way that it's 12.30. What you're going to have to do here, again, I'm going to say this here to you very, very carefully, is you're now going to come along here and you're going to read, okay, the questions in Section B, and there are nine of them. Now, now, this is important. Uh, choose wisely. I really mean this, guys. Okay, choose your five questions because the one thing you don't want to do is get started to a question and after 10 minutes realize, oops, I shouldn't have started this one or to realize I'm kind of caught. Now, at the same time, you don't have all day, so you have to kind of, kind of keep moving here. So that's what I say when you read, okay, like you read them carefully, but kind of move on here, okay? Don't delete do, 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 Ali, okay? You know, now try and choose what you think will be your five best questions, this is your strategy, okay? And then straight away, okay, get started, okay? Get started on what I would call your five questions. And I come back to this thing here again, guys, okay? Give yourself the idea, say, of the 20 minutes. Now, if you do five questions or 20 minutes each, that's 100 minutes. That's an hour and 40 minutes. But altogether, okay, here, all together here, if you don't mind me saying so, you've got two hours. Or do you know what? Even if we're working in minutes, you've got about maybe, should say, say, 120 minutes to get this all done. But I would actually argue, of that 120 minutes, easily 10, easily 10 minutes, okay, would be taken up, okay, in a case like this here, reading and choosing. I genuinely feel that, okay, because you're not going to be able to just kind of say, just dive straight into the actual questions. And I believe, I'll tell you one thing, the 10 minutes you will spend reading and choosing is a very wise 10 minutes. That That's what I would call time extremely well spent. Absolutely, yes, absolutely, yes, okay. And then have a go at your five questions. Now, question that people write me is to say, Pat, what if like things go quite well? 
and I get my A's done and I get my B's done. And I look at my watch and I've still got 15 minutes left. Sometimes even people say to me, I've got half an hour left, whatever, okay? You know, 20 minutes left. Should I do an extra question? And I, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I find myself constantly saying no. And people are sometimes taken aback by that. And they say, well, what do you mean? And I'm just going to show a little argument here uh, that I would have against doing an additional question. And it's like this. You see, in section A of the exam, you've got questions one, two, three, four, and five. And then in part B, okay, you have the questions six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Now, just to make life easy, let's say you do one, two, and three. And let's say here you do six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just, just pretend they're your they're your questions, okay? Now, forget about section A for one moment. In here, guys, okay, the most you can score in a question is what I would call the 56 marks out of the 400. Now, let's say question six just absolutely goes like trilling before you, okay? And you absolutely ace it with the ace it with the full 56. And then next question here, you score, say, a 52. Let's say this guy here, you score 50. And these are all out of 56 now, okay? And let's say question nine, okay? Maybe, sir, you've got here, say, a 46. And let's say question 10, should say, drops down here to a 40. So let's say your worst question on the day was 40 marks out of 56, okay? Now, now, here's the situation you're in. You've got 15 minutes left. And do you do an extra question? And you have a look at this, okay? I decide, I've got a love question 13. I'll have a go at this here. And in the space of the next 15 minutes, you manage to get 40 marks there as well. Now, the reality is you just got zero. Because you see, there's your five questions. Your sixth question got your 40 marks, but that 40 is the same as that 40. And they can only give you one of those. Okay, you have to take your best five questions. And there's your best five questions. Okay, and I'd actually argue the 15 minutes that you had got you basically zero. You just wasted 15 minutes of, uh, should I say, an examination. And you got nothing for it. Okay. Now, what if, for example, K, okay, instead you got, say, 41 marks? Okay. Then they will give you 41 instead of 40. But my gosh, it took you 15 minutes to get one mark. I'm thinking, wow, that wasn't a great return for your effort. You see? And my argument is when you do an additional question, you only benefit from an additional question if the mark you get exceeds your worst question up to then. But you see, if you chose wisely in the first case, okay, you see, you'll find that question 10 will naturally be better than 13. Because in fairness, you took your time to choose wisely. So my experience is when students do additional questions, almost always the marks to get for the additional questions, okay, are less than what they've already got. So basically they get absolutely nothing. And that's been my experience, say, in correcting service sort of, exams for years and years and years. I find in general, okay, excuse me, <clears throat> in general, additional questions are not of benefit to you unless, as, as I said, they, they exceed, you know, by a good few marks, one of your questions you've done already. And the chances are that's probably not going to happen because of the way you chose in the first case. Now, if I have 15 minutes left, okay, what I would be doing is, excuse me, <clears throat> what I would be doing is I'd be going back and I'd be looking, sure, say, at the questions I've done, same up here. I'd be looking for the obvious mistakes, like, you know, when I drew a graph, did I label the x-axis and the y-axis? Did I include the units? Um, when I did a calculation, like, you know, I was asked to calculate a force, did I say seven or did I say seven newtons? You know, the, the obvious little things like that there. And even still, okay, even just the calculations you've done, just, just check the calculations one more time, maybe, on the calculator. And I say all these things to you because I'm sure you'd agree that's places where you've been kind of, say, dock marks over the years. So I just said, you know, just, just to be kind of what I would call, kind of, say, mindful of what I would see as stuff like that there. So I, I'm, I'm a great believer in the plan here of the 20 minutes, okay? And then when you say to me, what about an extra question? My inclination is to say to you, no, that would not be what I would call a priority. Absolutely not. Okay. Now, with that being the case, there was one of the small little thing I just wanted to mention here to you, just conscious again of time going by, and it's the following. Um, there was a question. I, I, I'm going to tell you about basically what the area or the topic is basically about here for one small little second. Okay. And it's just this. It's the area that deals with what I would call um, nuclear fusion. Okay, just write the end there as a short way of writing down nuclear. Okay, now, the strange thing was just this. There was a famous question in nuclear fusion in the year. I'll write down what the year was. The year was 2006. Now, do me one little favor, okay, because I've just got to say, dig out this little question here for you, okay? And I'll tell you basically what it actually was about. What they did was they gave you a little equation. And it said to you, okay, that you had a thing here called H12, 
and you combined it with another material called H13. And then what you got here was a thing called helium, say, 24, like this here. And as well as that, okay, you got a neutron 01. Now, <clears throat> just one little second, okay? This guy and this guy are hydrogen. They're not your normal hydrogen. They're called special isotopes. You join them together, okay, you got helium. And as well as that, okay, this chap here was known as a neutron. Now, let me just flip that page there for one little second because of why. You see, people sort of say, Pat, Pat, um, I know H is hydrogen, but what's with the 1-2, the what's with the 1-3? And see, hydrogen is normally H11, but there is a special hydrogen called H12, and there is a guy here called H13. Yes, there is, okay? But the subtle difference is, if you look at the nucleus of this hydrogen, okay, in here is your nucleus, it contains one proton. But this hydrogen is a little bit different because why? He contains one proton, but also one neutron. Yeah, there is a type of hydrogen that can have one proton, one neutron. And then this type of hydrogen here, okay, very simply has one proton and two neutrons. And they are known very often as the three isotopes of hydrogen, okay? And then just what sometimes causes slight complication, this guy here has another name. He's known as deuterium, D-E-U-T-E-R-I-U-M, okay? And then this guy here is called tritium, spelled T-R-I-T, and then I-U-M, okay? Now, they're all basically hydrogen, but the reason I'm drawing your attention to this is, what you were basically asked to do is, could you work out the amount of energy released? Now, what has to happen is you've got to look at these guys here. I've got to work out what's the mass when you put the two together. What are the two masses together? I've got to look over here, okay? I've got to kind of calculate, okay, what the mass is afterwards. So, and this information, by the way, in 2006 was all supplied. So we very nicely gave you the mass before and he gave you the mass afterwards. So you have to just add up what it was before out of what it was afterwards. Now, big shock, big surprise, but not the same numbers. And what you realize is in the situation, you lost mass. So you work out, okay, what I would call the loss in the mass, okay? And you get that by just, just adding the masses before, adding the masses after, work out the loss. And all this information was supplied in the question. It was really, really nice, okay? Now, for what it's worth, okay, for what it's worth, okay, when I actually did a calculation, just give me a little second, okay, just, just randomly, okay, what I got here was just this. I got here, say, 2.8, okay, like that there, by 10 to the power, now just give me one little second, just looking at something here, should say, 10 to the power of, of minus, say, 29, and I'll write down of a kg. That, that, that's what it worked out. And this is using the numbers that were supplied to me way back in 2006. And then when I was actually asked to get the energy, I just used the famous equation, Einstein's equation, E is equal to the mc squared. Now, one little second, okay, that m, okay, is the mass you just lost. C is the speed of light which would have been given to you in 2006, put in the numbers and everybody will happily ever after. Great. Well, great until six years later. Now, what am I on about? In 2012, he asked the same question, like this here, I kid you not. Now, the trouble is just this, okay? When the same question appeared, people thought, oh, this is great, okay? I just can repeat. Except they realized, oh my gosh, the masses, were not supplied in the question. In 2006, yes. In 2012, no. Why? Because they're in the maths tables. And the maths tables had arrived in Ireland in basically 2011, the year before this. Now, here's where the problem arises, you see, as a double whammy, okay? And it's just this. The masses were in here. But a lot of people didn't know where they are. And they're actually, would you believe it, guys, on page 83. That's where they are. Now, the funny thing is, if you look here for one little second, okay, if you look down here, now I know the camera isn't very good at picking this up, okay, and you're, you're, I'm not sure if the camera can actually pick it up, but it's page 83, I'll, I'll give the page reference there, okay, it's page 83, and if you want to get the mass of the hydrogen 2 and the mass of the hydrogen 3, they're both sitting here, okay, there's a hydrogen 2, there's a hydrogen 3. Now, the funny thing is just this, I'll write down what the values were, 2.014, it says here there's, there was 2, 0.014. I'll hold on one little second. Okay, I'll say 102. And then I'd add on, okay, and the mass of the hydrogen tree was here as well, 3.016. I'll write down to 3.016, okay, and then 049. Okay. Now, the only trouble is <clears throat> anybody could add those together. Yeah, there's one little problem. The units he gave you were in kilograms. <laughs> Not a complication. 
The unit is a funny little thing, and the unit is called U, a small little thing there called U. Now, the trouble is you had to convert that to kilograms. And guess where the conversion is? Yep, you have it in one. It's in the maths tables. And of course, it's on the very, very famous page, the page 46, 47, where you've got all those very important numbers. OK, and when you go back to page 46, 47, this you guy, he's the second last chap on page 47. So you see the trouble that was presented, OK, was that students had to be able to get the mass before. And they got that by going to page 83 to get the masses and then page 47 to compare or to, I, mean, I, should, I should make a part not to compare, to actually translate the masses from you back into kilograms. So there's a lot of what I would call um, kind of messing around with the math tables. Now the sad thing is in 2012, remember the math tables were very, very new. Most students hadn't a clue that the information was here, but it actually is. OK, and the fame, same thing applies over here. The helium is actually sitting here on page 83. There he is. OK, no problem. OK, and the, and the only other problem is the neutron, it, the mass of neutron is not here. OK, the mass of neutron was, of course, no big surprise, back on the famous page 46, 47. OK, and in fact, the neutron mass is the very bottom number here on page 46. So it was the ability to move between page 83 and then what I would call pages say 46, 47, th th this, this double page here, okay, is a very, very, very important page in the maths tables. Now, I'm not sure if you've done nuclear fusion in school yet, okay, but I often think, you know what, if you're to get a question, it'll be the same question again, it'll be the same as 2006, except because we have maths tables, it'll be more like the 2012 question. And I would actually highly, highly recommend there to you, you check out, okay, that question on nuclear fusion. We haven't seen nuclear fusion for quite a while. It'd be a good one to look at. And I think that 2012 will be absolutely spot on. And again, remember, you'll be fluctuating between pages 83 and pages 46, 47 in the good old trusty maths tables. I just think that um, if for some reason you weren't aware of that, okay, well, basically the question then, in, in, with all due respects, will be impossible to do because the information is in the tables. You just need to be able to locate it, okay, and just be aware of it, okay? Now, as I look at the clock there, I realised I was talking there a moment ago about timing, okay, and I realised my time is up, okay, and the last thing I want to do is kind of annoying you or uh, overly or annoying you too much. So what I'll say, first of all, first of all, thank you very much for your attention here. I sincerely hope you got something out of this master class. Um, like, you know, as I said, okay, I hope it's of some benefit to you. And what I wanted to basically do was, uh, as I said, not only just thank you for your attention, but could I wish you all the very best luck in the next four months of study. I'll go back to what I said at the start. It's a lot of time. You get a lot of work done. And most important of all, the very, very best of luck, guys, in the exam next June. So thank you very much for your attention and all the best, okay, with all your studies. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank bye. you. Bye.